Hey there, Sam. There are two types of operations in JavaScript, synchronous and asynchronous operations. Synchronous operations, or sync for short, are operations that run on the spot. For example, when we set a variable or we want to console log something, these are all considered as sync operations because when JavaScript sees them, JavaScript will run them right away. Asynchronous operations, or async for short, on the other hand, are operations that would delay their execution. For example, set timeout and set interval are considered as asynchronous operation because when JavaScript sees them, JavaScript will not run them immediately. JavaScript will only run asynchronous operations once all the synchronous operations are completed. I'll show you what I mean. So if I add another console log right after my set timeout, what do you think will happen here? What would we see inside the console? I've set the delay of my set timeout to be zero second. So technically it should run immediately right after the first console log, right? Let's find out in the browser. Well, it turns out, hey babe, runs after you and there. But why is that? The reason is set timeout is a nice synchronous operation and JavaScript will only run it after all the synchronous operation. When JavaScript sees an asynchronous operation, it will throw it into a queue system known as the event loop. Let's visualize this with my amazing drawing skill. So suppose we have a list of operations here. Every item in this list represents an operation awaiting JavaScript to run. It's sort of like a to-do list for JavaScript. So we have a synchronous operation, one, followed by another synchronous operation, S2, and right after S2, we have an asynchronous operation, one, and after that, we have another synchronous operation, S3, followed by two more asynchronous operation, A2 and A3, and lastly, an S4. And now let's say this is the queue system, the event loop, which looks something like a box. And now let's go through our to-do list as JavaScript. So when JavaScript sees our first synchronous operation, S1, it will run it right away. So S1, check. S2 is synchronous as well, so we'll check it off immediately. Next, we have an asynchronous operation, A1. We're not going to run it immediately, so we'll put it inside the event loop. So we'll bring it over to the box. Next, we have synchronous operation, S3. We'll do it right away. And after that, we have A2 and A3. And similar to A1, we bring it over to the event loop. And lastly, we have S4 in the list. We'll run it immediately, just like the other synchronous operations. Now that we have completed the list, we'll now go to the event loop and start doing the item from the top to the bottom. So A1 done, A2, and finally A3, and we're done. So that's how JavaScript deals with synchronous and asynchronous operations in a nutshell. We first finished all the synchronous operations, then the asynchronous operations. And now I want to introduce you a new concept called promise in JavaScript. A promise is another type of asynchronous operation in JavaScript. It is essentially an object that holds some sort of logic to be executed later. It works the same way as promises in the real life. So when we make a promise, we won't do it right away. Our promise holds until we start to take action to fulfill our promise. Since we're not completing our promise right away, this make it an asynchronous operation. I know this sounds a little bit abstract, but I promise I'll go through this with you. So let's make a promise to buy an ice cream. I'll create a function that accepts an argument called amount, which represents the money we're going to spend on ice cream. Now in this function, we need to return a promise. We will return a new promise. I'm using a new keyword here to create a new promise object. We'll talk about the new keyword in more details in a future video. For now, to create our promise object, we need to pass in a handler function inside the round bracket. This handler function is also known as the executor function. It contains the logic of our promise which will be later on executed inside the event loop. Now the executor function has two arguments, resolve and reject. You can name them anything you want, as long as you reference them properly inside the executor function. So the resolve argument is a function that we should call when the promise is successful. On the other hand, the reject argument is a function to call when the promise has failed. In our case here, if we have successfully bought our ice cream, we should call the resolve function. Otherwise, we should call the reject function. I'll show you what this means in just a second. Now, the only rule about the executor function is that the logic in it has to be an asynchronous operation. For that purpose, we usually put our logic inside a set timeout function. Our logic will be very simple. If the money given is less than three, which is too little to buy an ice cream, 
we're going to reject this promise. In other words, this promise will fail. So we're going to call the reject function by putting a round bracket after it and passing the message. I'll just say not enough money. Otherwise, if we have enough money, we will resolve this promise. In other words, this promise is a success. So we're going to call the resolve function. Again, put a round bracket after the resolve argument and pass in a success message. I'll just put in an ice cream. And that's how we use the resolve and reject argument. Okay, now let's take a look at how we can use our buy ice cream function. We're going to call it. I don't need to supply any argument here because the amount argument has a default value of 5. Now the buy ice cream function is returning us a promise. And there are two functions that we can call from a promise object. The then function and the catch function. The then function is used to handle the success promise response. It accepts a function where we put in a logic to tell JavaScript what to do when the promise is successful. And this function accepts an argument. And that argument represents the data that we pass in to the resolve function. So if I console log out response, I will expect to see an ice cream in the console. Now the other function, the catch function, works the other way. The catch function is where we handle a failed promise. And similar to the dot then function, the catch function also accepts a function. And that function is where we put in a logic to tell JavaScript what to do when the promise has failed. So if I pass in 2 to my buy ice cream function, I will expect the promise to fail. Because 2 is less than 3, so the reject function will run. And we see not enough money in the console. The thing about the then and catch function is that they will also return a promise object. And that's the reason on why I can call the dot catch right after the dot then. Because the then function is returning us a promise, and I'm calling the catch function on that promise object. So knowing this, we can chain a lot of then function on top of each other. And whatever you return in a previous then will be passed on to the next then as the argument of the handler function. For example, if I return a string, I bought an ice cream in my first then function, and I chain another then function right after it, console out the response, change 2 to 20, and we see I bought an ice cream in a console because the string has been passed on to the next then function. If you don't like to do it this way, you can also break out the promises into multiple variables. I'll set a variable by to be the result of buy ice cream and buy two to be the result of the first then and buy three to be the result of the catch function on buy two. However, I do not recommend you to write your promises in this way because it's very ugly. Now, here's a question that you might have at this point. Does the location of the catch block matter? Can we put the catch block in any order that we like? For example, move the catch block to line 42. The answer is yes, it matters a lot. Here's the thing, the catch block is only able to capture errors that happens in the then functions before it. I'll show you an example. So if we throw an error in the first then, the catch function is able to capture it. So far, so good. And line 47 is undefined because the catch handler is not returning anything. So the response is undefined. Now, if we throw another error in the second then, let's see what will happen. We get an uncaught error. Nothing is catching this error, and therefore JavaScript is not happy about it. And this is what I meant when the catch function is only able to catch errors that are thrown above it. Writing a promise seems to be a lot of work involved in it. That's actually a simpler and cleaner way to write a promise. The trick is using the async keyword. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to replicate the buy ice cream function, but in a much simpler way. So I create a new function called buy ice cream2. And instead of setting it to just a normal function, I'm going to add the async keyword before the function keyword. And inside this function, we no longer need to create a new promise object. The async keyword does all the heavy work behind the scene for us. We only need to focus on the logic that we put in inside the set timeout function. If you want to reject the promise, we just need to throw a new error. And to resolve the promise, we just need to return the result as a normal function. Take a good look and compare between these two functions. They are doing the exact same thing. But the async function is way cleaner than the first version. Let's test our buy ice cream 2 function. And it works just like before. Now, that's another benefit of using async function. I'm going to introduce you another keyword. It is called the await keyword. The await keyword can only be used inside an async function. And what it does is allow us to execute promises synchronously. Let's take a look at an example. 
I'm going to create a new async function called main. Now to demonstrate the power of the await keyword, I'll console log out hey, and then I'll await buy ice cream too. So the await keyword will force the promise to resolve immediately. And the result of this statement will be the data that we pass on to the resolve function inside the promise. So if I set the result to a variable here and console log it, and after that, I'll console log out another there just to show you it's running synchronously and run the main function. And now we see an ice cream before the word there. Here's the question though, why do we see an ice cream for two times? The reason is the await keyword will force the event loop to run. And remember, the task in the event loop has an order to it. The promise in line 47 is put to the event loop before the promise in line 52. And that's the reason why line 47 is run before line 52. And we see an ice cream for two times. Now, the last thing I want to cover before we end the lesson is the main benefit of using promises, which is avoiding callback hell. So in the previous lesson, we talked about how callback hell can look very, very ugly. So the weakness of callback can be easily resolved by promises. Let's take a look at the demo. I'm going to buy an ice cream. And after that, in a then function, I want to buy another ice cream. I can simply call the buy ice cream function again and return it. So the result of the buy ice cream function will be passed on to the next den. And in the next den, I'll call the buy ice cream function again and so on and so forth. Can you see how this has solved the main issue of callbacks? We're no longer nesting callbacks upon callbacks, but instead, we're keeping our indentation shallow. And that is the main reason why we prefer promises over callbacks. All right, key takeaway for this lesson. Synchronous operations run on the spot, while asynchronous operation run later in the event loop. Event loop is the name for the queue system that JavaScript uses for asynchronous operations. Promises are async operations that aim to solve the problems of callback. Async function returns promise. So instead of writing a boilerplate to create promises, we can just use this nice helper keyword before our function. And that's it for this lesson, and I'll see you again in the next video. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for your support.